today as we come to the table. Amazing to think that the most beautiful being in all the universe who created every other beautiful thing that's ever been created has decided to keep the scars from mankind on the cross to always remember that he did it for you and for me. Is that amazing or what? And more so, if this is gonna be eternally that he has these scars, for eternity we're gonna be reminded, you did that for me. His scars will always remind us of how much he loves us and how much he loved us on the cross. It's powerful. any scars? Maybe you had surgery and still have a scar from that, or maybe you were injured while helping someone. Maybe you were injured because of a bad decision you made. No matter how it came to be, a scar can be a powerful reminder of a decision you made, good or bad. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. In today's message, Pastor Mark reminds us that Jesus still has the scars from the cross. Not so much to remind him of the decision to go to the cross, but to remind you that he suffered the persecution of the cross so that you won't have to. The scars will always be a reminder of what he did for you and for me. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Revelation chapter 4 with today's edition of Come to the Table. In heaven, everybody loves talking about Jesus, and that's all they're doing, and the angels are shouting it around the clock. It's just Jesus, Jesus, holy, holy, holy. I mean, this is going to be awesome. So again, we shouldn't be ashamed. We shouldn't be fearful. We're simply visitors here on this earth until we get back in heaven. But this is our home. This is where we belong. So we need to be bold as well. Even as they're bold, we need to be bold. And he says, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, possibly a representation again of the, the church or definitely the saints throughout history, fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever, casting their crowns before the throne. Again, uh, this is what they were doing in John's vision as he was seeing this. They were falling down. Uh, I don't think this means necessarily that all we'll do in heaven is fall before the throne, although I'm sure we'd be satisfied with that. This is the vision that John's getting of us bowing before God, giving him that honor, telling him he's worthy to receive glory and honor and power. And notice this, for you created all things, and really the literal translation, uh, it says you, you created all things for your pleasure. And he says, and by your will, they exist and they were created. Now, why do I bring that out? Because here's what this verse is saying. The reason you exist is to bring God pleasure. But I thought it was about me and my dreams and my visions and my career and all that I wanted and my aspirations. God is gracious to bless us and he says he gives us all things richly to enjoy and God lets us pursue our dreams and all these things in our career. I'm not saying that's wrong, but that isn't why we were created. We were created to bring him glory and pleasure. And that's why the only thing that makes us happy is when we do that. I was one of those, going out to find myself, heading west to find myself. You know, these, you hit a certain age, you want to find yourself, whatever. You're trying to fill the emptiness. You, you've tried things and nothing's satisfying. This isn't doing it. I need more than this, right? And so you go and start looking. Until you realize that your whole purpose for existing is to please God and serve him, you'll never be fulfilled. And you'll never be happy. You think, wow, that just, I never knew that. Or that, you know, what about me? You know, well, yeah, because we're a me society. We're very focused on self. But here's the thing Jesus said that if we lose ourselves, that's where we'll find life. He said, if you lose your life, you'll find it. He said, if you try to get your life, you go for what you want and what you're after all the time, he said, you'll lose it. I, I lived that. I tried to find my life and do what I wanted, and life became death and dark. And then when I gave it to Jesus, then life became life. Why? Because what I was created to do kicked in. 
This is why I'm here. It's why you're here is to glorify the Lord and bring, uh, bring in pleasure. So this is why they exist and they were created by the Lord. The Bible says in uh, Colossians that Jesus Christ created all things. And here it says he created all things for his pleasure. That's us. And so why we were created. Chapter 5, he says, And I saw in his right hand, the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back and sealed with seven seals. Now we need to pause at verse 1. Here, just like we paused at verse 1 in chapter 4. Why? Because we need to understand sealed scrolls of that day. A scroll written this way, back in that day that was sealed, um, on front and back, it wouldn't have been a letter. Letters they wrote on the inside and you sealed them so you couldn't read what was on it. But title deeds were written on and sealed with seals and they were to prove that you owned land or property or a home or whatever the case might be. You remember the scene with Jeremiah. Jeremiah, God comes to Jeremiah when he's in jail and Babylon's about to take over and Jeremiah the prophet has been telling him, Babylon's coming to take Israel over and we're going to go captive into Babylon for 70 years. And then all of a sudden God says, now I'm going to send a relative of you to you while you're in prison, Jeremiah, and I want you to, to buy the property that he's selling. Because if it was in the family, you were able to buy family property because all the family inheritance of whatever tribe you were in was supposed to stay within the family. So they had what they called the kinsman redeemer. Or you would redeem the land. You would buy the deem back. You were a kinsman and you would be able to redeem any land. And let's say that your cousin or your uncle or somebody in your family had to sell their property because they needed the money to survive. They were going broke and whatever the case they had to pay to not go to jail or whatever it was. You could go as a family member and buy that. And then they could buy it back from you later if they ever had the chance. If they couldn't afford to, then you could keep it. But if they could afford to, then the gesture would be you'd let them buy it back and the family would keep the land and it would stay in the family and all this. So God sends a relative to Jeremiah and says, Jeremiah, I need you to buy this land of ours. I've got to get rid of it. doesn't tell us why he had to get rid of it. And Jeremiah's going, you know, he's got to be thinking, Lord, you just told me that we're about to go into captivity for 70 years. I'll never see this land. And the land's now going to be given to Babylon. Why would I buy this land? Well, because I told you to. Buy the land, and here's why, Jeremiah. And what God showed Jeremiah was, I'm showing you that you're buying this land. You're going to be taken out of it for a while, but you're going to get it back. I'm going to redeem that land. You will once again own that land. After the judgment is done in Babylon, I'll bring you back. You will break the seals, and you will own the title deed to the land, and Israel will be restored to its nation. So God was giving a picture of how this how the seals or how the, the scrolls work in that whole picture when he did that, showing them. And so John would have known exactly what this was. This was the title deed to the earth. Now, how do I know that? Because the Bible says that when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, they gave up their, their ownership. Satan took over and now temporarily owns this land we call the earth. How do I know that? Remember when Jesus was being tempted by Satan in the wilderness? Satan said, bow down and worship me and I'll give you the world because it's been turned over to me. It's mine. Jesus didn't say, you can't do that, Satan. I rebuke you for saying that the earth is yours. The earth is not yours. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That's true. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, ultimately. But look at it this way. The Bible says that temporarily Satan is the tenant. Temporarily, he's maybe better to say Satan is the landlord. It would be like you have an owner of the mall, but he rents out different spots to people in the mall. When Adam and Eve sinned, they sold the rights to the earth to Satan. And Satan gave that offer to Jesus, and Jesus said, No way. You will serve the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. Jesus didn't refute it. Jesus didn't say that's not true. You don't have it to give. He just simply said, I'm not going to do that. And certainly Satan would have known that God knew the truth. You couldn't lie to God and get away with it. And so what we see in Scripture is, is that right now, Satan is the landlord of the earth, although it is ultimately owned by God and will one day be repossessed by God. Satan has rights over the land ownership of the earth at this time. Now, why is that very interesting? Because a lot of people will say, if God is a God of love, why are so many people starving? Why are there so many murders, so many rapes? Why is there so much evil? Because Satan right now is the landlord. And as long as Satan is the landlord of the earth, there will be murder, rape, starvation, death, all these things. Sometimes God reaches in despite Satan having the rulership now and heals or rescues the starving. 
rescues the one being raped, rescues the one being murdered. Sometimes God, his grace, just does that, although it's not God doing it, and people try to blame God for that. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbelievers so they can't see the glory of Christ. It actually calls Satan the God of this world, small g. He's not God like God Almighty, but the reference means right now, he governs the earth. And it also tells us in Daniel and Revelation that one day he's going to make the same offer that he made to Jesus to the Antichrist. So you know what? You bow down to me and I'll give you the keys to the world. You got a deal. And so the thing that Jesus rejected because he said, you shall serve the Lord thy God and him only shall you serve, the Antichrist will say, I'll take it and he will temporarily rule the earth for seven years. And of course, Satan will use him as his pawn during that time. But now we see John in heaven seeing this title deed to the earth and notice what happens. Verse 3, and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. Wow. What John thinks at this moment is there's nobody that can buy the earth back. It forever belongs to Satan. It's forever going to be as corrupt as it is. It's forever going to be as destructive as it is. And so this is what John thinks at this moment because no one stepped forward immediately to take the scroll. And it had to be the person who was the kinsman redeemer. It had to be someone who had the right to take the scroll to buy it back. There's only one person who could buy the earth back, and that is the one who died for the earth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? That whosoever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life. Jesus died to purchase the earth back, and right now it's being landlorded by Satan, if you will. One day he's going to come back and take his possession. And so John doesn't know it at this point. Look at verse 4. So I wept much. Again, John knew what was going on on the earth. He knew what was, Now he saw what was going on in heaven. He's saying, I don't want to go back down there. And if nobody redeems the earth, how am I going to get here? How do we save mankind? So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, that is one of the saints that was around the throne, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. That is, Jesus died for the sins of the world. He has purchased the earth back. He has purchased mankind back. Relax, John. It's all taken care of. Wouldn't this be great news? And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and, and the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been Slain. Now, this is interesting because is John just seeing this in this vision to show that it's Jesus who died for us, or does Jesus still have the scars in heaven? It would appear, at least at this point, whether he will eternally or not, only God knows, but it would appear at this point right here, Jesus still has the scars from the cross in heaven. Now, this is wild. Actually, in his new body that he resurrected in, he still had the scars, didn't he? Because he told the guys, hey, fill my hands. Put your hand on my side. It's me. And it said they saw the scars. And so amazing to think that the most beautiful being in all the universe who created every other beautiful thing that's ever been created has decided to keep the scars from mankind on the cross to always remember that he did it for you and for me. Is that amazing or what? And more so, if this is going to be eternally that he has these scars, for eternity we're going to be reminded, you did that for me. His scars will always remind us of how much he loves us and how much he loved us on the cross. It's powerful. So, as though a lamb had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, Again, horns, this is where the imagery comes in. We talked about understanding Revelation. Very simple once you understand the imagery. Horns in Scripture consistently represent strength and power. All right? Eyes, seven eyes, it represents the, it, it's eyes are eyes, but seven, the number of completion. The fact that the Lord sees all things. He is omniscient. He sees all things, and he has all strength and power. Seven horns. So he's attributing to the Lamb all power, all seeing, all authority, all everything goes to Jesus. That's all John is saying to the church through this code as he's getting this letter past the Roman guards. They would have known exactly what he was talking about. And these are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And again, 
uh, the fullness, the completeness and fullness of the Holy Spirit in these uh, seven spirits of God again. And then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So now he's got the deed, he has purchased the earth back, and he has the right to open it to take his land back. But when he comes back to take his land, he's going to have to kick some squatters off of it. And so now we're going to see as we get into the next chapter, the seven seals begin to be opened as God begins to take legal action to repossess what is rightfully his. Because Satan has wrongfully taken it over. We'll get into that not this week, uh, but next time. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, a couple of things. We tend to think of harps, again, the whole picture of, you know, we're going to be up in heaven floating on clouds playing harps. I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. Harp here just means stringed instrument. It, could be, it might even be better translated in our day and age, uh, something like this. Uh, each having a, a guitar and golden bowls full of incense. So they had some type of stringed instrument they were playing, even as like we just did before the set here, the worship set. And they're playing um, on these instruments. I'm not saying it's not a harp, but it's not limited to that. And the golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now this is really uh, intriguing to me, and I love it. We've talked about this before, but when the high priests, and actually any of the priests, would go into the temple area, they would go into the first area, which was the most holy place. And then behind the veil was what they called the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could go there once a year. But all the priests could go into the holy place. And that's where the menorah was and the showbread and, and, uh, and all this and, and the altar of incense. And the priests would go in with this incense, this special incense that God had to mix up and make. And they would take some coals from the altar that were burning out front in the sacrifices. They'd put the coals on that altar. And then they'd put the, sprinkle the incense on there and it would make this cloud of smoke. And they said the cloud would just puff up and fill the entire area. The whole area would just be filled with this white smoke with this beautiful smell, this very aromatic smell that just filled the room. And it represented the priest offering the prayers of the people up to God because at that time they went through the priest. Now we go straight to God, right? Because he died on the cross, the veil's been torn, we go straight to the Lord. But then you went through the priest. So they put that, and it would show the prayers going up to God in this whole thing from this bowl of, of, of incense that was sprinkled onto the altar, and then it would go up to God. Now we see the heavenly thing. Remember, everything in the earthly temple, God said, was a picture of the real one in heaven. So now we're getting a picture of not the, the one on earth, that's the temporary, fake one or whatever. Now we're seeing the one literally in heaven, and he offers the prayers of the saints, and they go up before the Lord. And that means now the, the prayers of all these saints for all these things that the evil people of the world have done to them over the years now comes before God, fills, no doubt, with a cloud of smoke, the throne of heaven, and God's about to take vengeance on behalf of his church and vengeance on behalf of his people. What I really love about this is the fact that God keeps our prayers up there. It's like in bowls in heaven. I mean, that's just a wild thought, isn't it? That there are bowls in heaven with your prayers in them? Now, what size bowl would God have? I wonder what size my bowl is. I bet I'm ashamed of it. It's like, man, that's a huge, whose bowl's that, you know? That person prays on a regular basis. Wow. Wow, whose bowl's that? Wow, that's even bigger. Well, that pray even more. Whose thimble? <laughs> it's yours, Mark. Okay. All right. But depending on how much you pray is how much your prayers are before the Lord in bowls in heaven. That's neat. That's exciting. It's actually a motivation to pray more for me. You know? What do you want to do this morning? Let's go bowling. All bad jokes will be struck down on the final day. <laughs> Never to rise again. They're the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. Look, this is a brand new song that's being sung. And it says, you are worthy to take... By the way, if you learn the words now, you guys are going to know it when you get there. This is literally the song you're going to be singing. Is that cool or what? It's not figurative. You will be singing these words before Jesus as you watch the incense going up before God and all the things. This is amazing. Here's what you're going to be singing. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Who has he redeemed? The church. 
really all believers, out of every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation. So we know he's not talking about the Jews here alone, because he says whoever he's talking to, this group of people that are singing, are every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. So it's the believers before his throne in heaven. And you've made us kings and priests to our God. Remember it says in uh, Revelation chapter 1 that we'll be kings and priests to the Lord. And he says, and we shall reign on the earth. It's interesting. He's talking about the believers. He's talking about the church because the church, it says, will be kings and priests to God. And the church will be reigning with the Lord in heaven. This is interesting because right after verse 1, which I believe is the rapture, now we see who I believe is the church in heaven before the great tribulation singing a new song to God. Is that cool or what? Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne. The living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, 100 million. Now, there's probably more than that, but 100 million he mentions here. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And boy, is he going to be worthy. You know, we're going to be there realizing he's redeemed us from the earth. He's rescued us from this mess that's about to happen. We're saved. We're with the Lord forever. We're praising. We're rejoicing. And this is going to be an amazing moment. He says, And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Now, this is interesting. Notice this. He says every creature, even those in the sea, are going to be saying blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. In some way, even the creation communicates with the Lord. Even the animals communicate with the Lord. I don't know how that's going to be, at least at this point. They're going to be acknowledging him in some form and fashion. I, mean, I don't think you're going to be fishing and what you just call it's going to see blessing, honor, praise. You know? I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, that'd be fishy, but okay. I said, but we're not, look, I said all bad jokes will be done away with on that final day. We're not to the final day yet. I still have time. So be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and they worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Again, I want to just encourage you guys. I know the world is crazy. I know that we're not the most popular people in the world right now. And I know that it's going to get interesting in the last days. And I know that we may go through the wrath of man. Some of it. We may go through some of the wrath of Satan before it's all done but we will never go through the wrath of God. And if we think the wrath of man and the wrath of Satan are bad, can you imagine what God's power and authority is when he brings down his wrath? So that's a reason to rejoice and to know that at some point the Lord is coming, is gonna rescue us out of here, and it's gonna be a done deal. And guys, that's where our hope lies. Thanks for joining us today on Come to the Table with Pastor Mark Kirk. Pastor Mark is going through some teachings that cover Revelation. The book of Revelation is always one of those books that either draws people in or sends them running in confusion. But it doesn't have to be so puzzling that you stay away. In fact, as Pastor Mark's been going through these passages, our hope is that you're coming to a deeper and greater realization of who Jesus is in all of it. Thanks for tuning in. And we'd like to invite you to come visit us even this week. If you're in the Knoxville area, we'd love for you to come to Calvary Knoxville this weekend. Our services are Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 9.30 and 11.15 a.m., and a midweek service every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. And we'd love for you to bring the whole family. Every time we gather, it's another opportunity for you to grow in how you're experiencing God. If you're interested and would like more info, Click on the church link at the bottom of the page at thewaymedia.net. You can also use the questions and comments link to get more info. And if you want to listen to any of these studies again, just click on the Come to the Table link online or connect with the Way Media app. That website again is thewaymedia.net. You can also get in touch with us over the phone at 865-609-1385. One more time, that number to connect with us is 865-609-1385.
1385. That's about all the time we have for today. But please join us again in Revelation right here on Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.